welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Cher Fox from Fox Consulting. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity. And this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management to understand how they got there and to talk with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Cher Fox, the president of Fox Consulting, and normally this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Cher, hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. We had such a good time at DGIQ and chatting and I'm so glad that to learn more about you and uh, and where your your background. So, but let's start. You know where you are today. You're the president of Fox Consulting. So tell me, what type of business is Fox Consulting? So Fox Consulting, the majority of it has been it's a consultancy for myself. Uh, we are often a an agile data strategy consulting firm where we do partner with clients. Um, and those can be all the way up to global organizations on working through their data management challenges and strategies. Nice. Um, and as the president, what do you do? Well, I'm not only the president, uh, I am also the founder and an entrepreneur. So I do a lot of things. I wear a lot of hats. I do marketing operations financials, contract negotiations, as well as, you know, work day to day with clients uh, in their data ecosystems, uh, solving their problems. I love it. And I know that you work with clients and how, what, and their data, but how do you work with data in your job? So, I mean, I'm really lucky that my clients entrust me to wear a lot of hats for them as well. Mm -hmm. I work all the roles in an entire SDLC, I could be doing business analysis for them to technical support and all the roles in between. And that can you know, range from data analyst, uh, data engineering, data architecture, data modeling, mapping. It really, I've been so blessed that my clients maybe have brought me in to solve a niche problem. Mm -hmm. And then have really allowed me to expand my breadth of what I'm capable of doing for them uh, in multiple roles, because I mean, you know how it, it's hard today to find good people. And sometimes yeah. if you've already integrated someone into your team, it's, it doesn't hurt to give them a shot at learning something new. So, or taking a stab at something, maybe while you are, you know, trying to find that, you know, that role or that person to fit that role, but maybe somebody else can get going on it a little bit sooner than later. So I've been really lucky to work with data building warehouses and marts and cubes and developing business intelligence and analytics. And I do a lot of technical writing, which we tend to find a lot of developers aren't very good at, but I love it. And it's something I'm really strong in. And I, I believe in leaving clients with really good documentation because, you know, all the things I had in my head, you know, when you're not there anymore, they need to have access to all of that right. one way, shape or another. So. Oh, I love that touch. I, I love, uh, of course, you know, I'm kind of a geek. I love a good process documented. I mean, <laughs> Sometimes but, you invent a process. Yeah, um, sure. You know, yeah. several years, several years ago before COVID, a, a colleague and I developed a test automation framework using tools that you can find on your desktop at your company's desktop. You do mm -hmm. not have to spend money to build a test automation framework, at least not from acquiring a tools perspective. So, but 
if you don't document that well, the clients, right. you know, they're not going to know, okay, I'm going here, I'm bobbing here, I'm weaving here, I'm, I'm darting over here. Yeah. You, have to, you have to leave them some really strong documentation so so they can be self-service, you know, when your time with them is sadly done. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Is there a common problem that you find your customers have, or is it just all over in terms of data? It sounds like you do a lot. I, I've been lucky to do a lot. I think I think all clients, all organizations, they have some level of data quality issues. Mm-hmm. That's just, it's just the, the nature of the beast. And as more and more data is coming at us from more and more sources and more and more technologies, it gets harder and harder to keep up with it and, you know, re- keep that, that pace which tends yes. to be pretty quick. So I think data quality is is a is a bit of a challenge for everybody. And that was why in 2016, you know, we set out trying to create a test automation framework that would remove that roadblock for data teams, mm-hmm. you know, to say, well, we don't have money or, you know, we, we don't have budget, we, we don't have resources, things of that nature to say, that's okay, you have everything you need. Um, but I think as we've learned and as time has gone on, you know, test automation is a little bit of a reactive right. fashion and approach to data quality. Whereas, you know, now we're into data observability and we have all these really cool new ways of evaluating data as it's coming into our ecosystems and our source systems so that we maybe have more information about our data sooner. Oh, very, very cool. Well, we can get into that a little bit more, but let's back up a bit here then share, you know, uh, is this what you wanted to be when you grew up? Like when you were say six years old, did you think yourself, I am going to grow up to be a founder of a business that helps people with their data? Definitely not, especially not. (laughs) What was the dream? (laughs) I I think at six, I didn't even really know what a programmer was, you know, even though we had movies that exposed us to technology like war games and and things like that. But I don't think we realized that all the people that were sitting behind all the consoles were programmers or were working with data and things like that. So no, I had I had pretty simple dreams uh, when I was a child. I I really wanted to be a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader. Oh, I love it. <laughs> or a solid gold dancer. Do you remember the do you remember oh, the yeah. show Solid Gold? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, they had they had a great dance troupe. Um, yeah. and I grew up around animals. So I was actually really mm. interested in being a veterinarian. Mm. Um, but when we got into when I got into high school, uh one biology science track was dissecting cats. Oh, and one yeah. track was dissecting a shark. And I looked at the cat and I said, I can't cut into furry things. And that, you know, that definitely took being a vet, being a vet off the table, even in a, yeah. you know, helpful capacity, it, it yeah. wasn't going to happen. I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. <laughs> oh, I don't blame you. <laughs> I'm with you on that. <laughs> you know, and oddly, because I was really good at math and science, you know, my, and I was an extrovert, my dad said, you know, hey, you might make a really good electrical engineer. Um, mm. They're not typically extroverted people. They're not typically women. You know, you'll you'll be going against the grain a little bit. And so when I started college, my major was electrical engineering. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I love that. So uh, is that what you, you're, you ended up with your major? Is that? Uh, I actually ended up with an Associates of Computer Science uh-huh. Uh, we'll, we'll get maybe into my career path a little bit more later, but, uh, due to being relocated frequently for mergers and acquisitions, it was really hard for me to keep up a consistent collegiate schedule. Mm-hmm. And the last corporation that I officially worked for ended up paying for a master's degree in mm-hmm. classes but I only achieved an associates. That's how many t- times I tried to sign up for classes, tried to get classes started and wasn't able to uh, do to work. So yeah, yeah. Life is hard and it tends and sends you in so many different directions. I totally understand. It does. Yeah. And it, it's hard to prioritize. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's really interesting. So then, um, so then tell me about what you were doing for, for work then. So I actually got started programming when I was just 12 years old. We had a Commodore 64 home computer 
and mm-hmm. it had a beautiful manual that explained to you how to make the floppy disk that goes into the floppy disk drive work. <laughs> yeah. So I sat down, you know, over a few weekends and just kind of learned how to use the system and learned how to work the system. Um, I think that aptitude just became really natural for me. And mm-hmm. while I was still in high school, at the age of 15, I got my first job programming uh, mm-hmm. those restaurant pager devices, you know, like the light up coasters that you get at Outback yeah. Steakhouse or Chili's. Those yeah. were invented in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And that wow. was my first like real job. Um, I was a little ahead in school. I got started a little younger. And so I graduated a little younger, but yeah. because I was so ahead on my credits, I was able to leave school at half day and go to work. So, wow. And that was really exciting for me because mm-hmm. I was already at 15, a woman, a programmer. I was, I was already breaking, you know, a lot of stereotypes in, you know, what we expected of programmers. So that was, that and, awesome. and it was a fun project to learn on. I mean, yeah. you know, to, to get the programming right and have the coaster light up, you know, we, we still find that joy today when we're waiting for our table reservations. So, yeah. um, but after high school, I, I started working, uh, through temporary agencies and what that allowed me to do was sit in front of a computer for gosh, almost a month. And I mm-hmm. learned, self-learned I, yet again, uh, Lotus smart suite, which was Lotus one, two, three, mm-hmm. and you know, it's host of things, the Microsoft office suite and word perfect ended up absorbing some of the Corel products and they used to have yeah. an entire suite. So yeah. I spent weeks going through all of these programs and learning them and then testing out of them to be placed as a temporary, as temporary help for, for companies. And it seemed like every time I started with a company, I was working in the spreadsheet. I was almost always working in the spreadsheet. I was responsible for data. And I mean, I learned how to do data analysis in Lotus 123 for DOS, not even on a Windows <laughs> platform. So that's that's how long ago that was. Flashbacks. That's dinosaur days, right? That's dinosaur days. <laughs> olden times. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, it just seemed like I was always responsible for data. Yeah. And then and then oddly enough, documenting it and explaining it to other people. How did you get from point A to point B? Um, yeah. And then I landed, I spent years, four or five years, uh, just kind of temping and moving in and out of organizations and learning about companies. And um the I hired on a couple of times during those five years, but yeah, wouldn't you know it? last to be hired on is the first one to be laid off when there's cut. So, so a couple yep. of those opportunities uh, didn't, didn't work out for me long-term, but I started on a project team that was developing a cash management software and the company had, had cash management hardware. So they were trying to tie all of this hardware together and collect all the data from it. And cash management hardware is, it's, you know, what a teller has behind behind her wall at the bank. It's her drawer. It's her machine. It's the cash counter. It's the coin counters. It's it's all of those kinds of things that this or that this uh, company had developed and was trying to, you know, put more technology behind it and put more information behind it. And I worked on this team for 18 months, almost two years. And I originally started as the technical writer. All these people mm-hmm. were writing code. And they needed someone to translate it into a manual. And then we started bringing in our internal customers from our other client sites to learn how to use this software and to tie all of the hardware together. Mm -hmm. Then I started training. And then soon I'm making little program edits. Hey, we have a bug. Can you go in and take a look at it? And it just, it just progressed and progressed and progressed with more opportunity to learn that in the end, I could do pretty much everyone's job on my team, which was really great for me, but not really so great for them when that company was acquired. (laughs) And the parent company was out of England and they laid off my entire team, but kept me. Oh, wow. Because I had done it all. And there were a couple people 
that, you know, I definitely would credit as mentors today that were mentors to me then. Yeah. That saw some potential in me and said, you know, hey, let, let's keep share around. We think, you know, she can help with some other things, but, you know, she's going to be able to own that entire process. And then that started moving into, well, I was, I was part of the company that was acquired. Then all of a sudden now I'm being sent out to other companies that were looking to acquire and learning wow. their learning their software systems and their processes and creating documentation around that and supporting that. Um, and so in five years, I was really lucky. Uh, I was, it would have been from the ages of 20 to 25 uh, mm -hmm. that I got to stay with this company in this track, uh, having new opportunities put in, put in front of me every year. I was promoted almost every year with, pretty healthy pay increases every year. And I just, I had really just found some people that believed in me and I, I really enjoyed what I did. So sadly, when, you know, I went to register for school nights, yeah, like, Hey, we got to relocate you to, to Philadelphia <laughs> for six months. Sorry. Yeah. You're like, yeah. all right. You know, I'll, I'll travel on the company dollar and, you know, see the world as a young single woman. And, so it was, oh, yeah. it was hard to balance those things. You know, and of course, schools weren't prepared for the level of remote learning that they have now. So I would be lucky to maybe talk one teacher into letting me do, do some remote things or write some papers about my projects that I was doing for work to almost test out of my classes. So they'd go, well, oh, just just go 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 write me three programs in COBOL and get those back to me. If they're good, you'll pass the class. Okay, great. So, you know, there there were yeah. some opportunities, but it was pretty rare. And my transcript is a disaster <laughs> just for two years. <laughs> so. Well, I, I just want to stop there and pause there for yeah. a moment because, you know, uh, having uh, worked on at least one or two acquisitions in, in my time, well, a few actually, um, I know there's, I mean, the hardest thing with an acquisition isn't just the merger of people, but the data, right? There's so much data that you need to, to merge and figure out how to, like you say, merge those processes. And, uh, and it's really comes down again to the data uh, within those processes, you know, the financials, the systems, any customer, you know, systems, anything like that. So, I mean, um, so it sounds like you were really involved in not just programming, but the data of, um, uh, sorry, really started getting into the data of, of companies. In, in a lot of respects. Yes. Sometimes mm -hmm. the mergers and the acquisition would sadly be to go into a department and figure out what are we keeping? What are we selling? What are we abandoning? Mm -hmm. And that, that can be people processes yeah. or technologies. So uh, yeah. we, we would, we would absorb, you know, what we could um, and, and, you know, even with, with other mergers and acquisitions, sometimes you learn that what you're acquiring is actually better than what you're doing and what you have. Right. So that yeah. tends to become the master in what you strive for. You don't always require, we'll call them child companies. You don't always require them to assimilate to everything the parent's doing. Sometimes, sometimes they're doing some things that are smarter, right? More sure. right that you say, Hey, I think we're going to lean in, in that direction more. So, um, yeah, yeah. but the, the parent company, they tended to buy other companies like the company that they had bought with mine. So mm -hmm. I was going in, figuring out what hardware we were keeping, what hardware we were going to integrate into our cash management software. What were we going to abandon? What clients did we have to, you know, migrate over to a new customer support center? Um, you know, how were we going to take care of them? How was that going to be different from how they used to be taken care of by the child company and things of that nature? So yeah. Um, yeah. It, it wasn't always about the data. I think there's a lot more to, you know, what I was sure. responsible for mergers and acquisitions wise. Uh, but in the end, it, it, it does boil down to to a lot of data and the amount of data that that hardware is generating, whether that's a cash counter or, you know, that's on literally a counter, or whether it's a three-story high 
change machine that Chicago Transit Authority is dumping all of their bus change into and it's sorting it and it's counting it and it's wrapping it and it's spitting it out ready for bank deposit at, you know, three stories down, you know, somebody's sure. going to climb up two flights of stairs to dump <laughs> it all in. So, um, you know, that generates a lot of data, but yeah. I feel like at that time, some of that data was short lived because once the deposit, you know, once the, the monies that or the information that came out of the, the say the change counter once that was reconciled against the bank, we, we were good. We, we didn't need that. We didn't need to keep that data so for so long. Sure. And, and yeah. um, it, I don't think everyone was always analyzing it to say, okay, why do we get more change on Thursdays and Fridays than other days of the week? Or, you know, what are our transit patterns based on money? They, they weren't looking at the data from an analytical perspective. I think from that, that kind of asking questions of it to improve their businesses and their processes. Yeah. It was, I do, I have a hundred dollars in quarters. They took a hundred dollars in quarters at the bank. We have a match for good. <laughs> So there were probably a lot of other opportunities, but our software didn't spur those kinds of questions and I think drive that kind of innovation. But then again, this was before uh, the year 2000. So, I mean, that software, you know, only had a two digit year. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, but, you know, did data like, you know, how many employees the child company has, you know, how much, you know, revenue and, and the, you know, that kind of data and um, that you have to, you know, bring over like that kind of, you know, what are you going to, what, what are you going to merge, you know, what, what are you going to drop like exactly? Um, well, it's fascinating. Okay. So um, where did you go from there? Unfortunately, and yet again, uh, yeah. there was another layoff. Our parent company out of England laid off our entire division. Yeah. I was the customer services manager. I had been promoted several times and was the customer services manager for the Americas, which was Alaska all the way down to the tip of South America. Uh, they closed our doors. They turned off our support telephone number. I had been one of part of my role responsibilities was managing a 24 seven help desk um, mm -hmm. again, which causes challenge when you're trying to go to school on top mm -hmm. of other things. Um, but because I had developed relationships with my customers through acquisitions or through, you know, my child, my original child company's relationships, most of them had my home telephone number. So mm -hmm. I'm getting calls from huge companies, Wells Fargo, uh, Chase Manhattan is what Chase was back in the day before they were JP Morgan Chase and, you know, I've had all their name right. iterations. Chicago Transit Authority. Hey, share the 800 numbers off. Oh, it's worse. <laughs> our entire division is, <laughs> our entire, you know, they literally put a padlock on our office doors. Oh gosh. When we showed up for work. Yeah. That was it. I was never clued in. The decision was made yeah. well above my head and well across the pond, frankly. Um, but I had people calling me and saying, can you help me? What am I supposed to do? What, what are your people going to do? Um, I had a I had a team of about 20 um, in a small office that we had built in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. We had built mm -hmm. a brand new office and within two years they closed it. It was it was wow. awful to see that kind of expenditure um, yeah. literally go to waste. Um, yeah. But I I made some phone calls and I talked to a lawyer and I said, I'm out of a job. These companies need help. What do I do? They said, start a company, help them. You didn't sign a non-compete. You know, we're always told, and yeah. we preach this to other people. Well, how do you start a company? Well, you have to find a need. Yeah. Well, my need was dropped right into my lap. So, right. you know, I had, I my journey is a little different, but, you know, that need was, had presented itself to me and I was in need and I had developed relationships with these people these clients and these people that were calling me at 
at midnight or at two o'clock in the morning or at 5 a.m. Yeah. We'd been out to dinners, you know, we'd, we'd done training together. We knew each other personally. I mean, obviously they had my home telephone number. So I yeah. started a company and, and helped all of my clients with their support and their migration. And in some cases to a new software selection of Y2K compliant software, um, nice. which is yeah. really great. But once Y2K was over and everyone was <laughs> migrated, yeah, I'd worked myself out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> so luckily, my husband and I, uh, we decided to leave Iowa and we moved to Colorado and, you know, outside of Denver, an amazing mm -hmm. tech hub here. Mm -hmm. I did what I've always done. I went back to temping. I signed up with a couple temporary agencies. They placed me out at some clients um, and customers of theirs. And I developed this beautiful network. And within a couple of years, I was back out on my own again. So, um, and doing and pivoting and, and yeah. doing more things with data, you know, not just being a programmer, you know, we don't, we don't really call anyone a programmer today. They're a developer, right. they're an architect, they're an engineer, you know, the, the title has shifted a little bit over time. We're still doing the same things, <laughs> but, <Not right. laughs> but you know, the, the title's gotten maybe a little shinier, a little glossier, but, and yet again, I, I fell into these really great opportunities with some clients and as, you know, my time with them increased, my opportunities with them increased um, I've been blessed. I've had clients keep me on retainer for up to six years. So, wow. and you, yeah. you wear a lot of hats for them over that time. Sure. And of course it almost becomes a not healthy relationship because when you're wearing 10 hats for them and they run out of contractor money, they can't replace you with 10 people. Right. So right. You're like, okay, well, we're going to give Karen this and Joe that and Linda this good luck. <laughs> so what happens you end up being a really good documenter because you have to brain dump for those three people yeah. of all the 10 yeah. you know, roles that you were doing for them before that I mean in some ways they maybe take for granted we'll just give it to Cher she'll take care of it for us it, Cher's mm -hmm. got it we, we know we can trust Cher she's got that ownership she's got that loyalty she's got that commitment to us but when we can't afford to keep, you know, share or her team members or other people around, it gets to be a, it gets to be a real dicey spot. So I don't recommend yeah. people keep consultants on retainer for, for six years, unless they're your lawyer, you know, lawyers are, lawyers are good for all time, but um, to have that kind of, to have that kind of data responsibility with an outside resource is really tricky to navigate uh, when that time is over. Yeah. And I, I love that you recognize that. I mean, it's just so healthy to, you know, uh, attitude to work with your clients. I mean, you're almost working yourself at a job, but also earning, like you say, you, you earn so much trust that way. And I, and again, I love that touch of providing all the documentation because it's just, yeah, it's so valuable. I would rather work myself out of a job earlier, you know, by like year three yeah. contract yeah. renewal three, you're going, so what's your exit strategy? Oh no, we don't need to talk about that right now. Like, uh, okay. okay. We'll wait up here. Right. Exit strategy. Oh no, we're good this year. <laughs> okay. I understand. So more and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. Oh, well, sure. You know, I, I love this story. I mean, it's just such a story of curiosity, of following your passion and following and just really being willing to just dive in and learn uh, a lot of new things. You know, that's the commonality that I'm finding because nobody's story is really linear when, uh, especially this day and age, getting into data management, right? You know, I mean, uh, so it's just 
but that's the commonality, the curiosity, that passion mm-hmm. for learning and, and, and wanting to learn more and wanting to help out and, and do something different. And I love that you took a hard thing, like getting laid off, um, and built it into such a cool thing, like starting your own business and worked really hard to do that. That's just really amazing. Well, what are you going to do? I mean, if right. I would have yeah. been a fool to have ignored the opportunity that was literally right. slapping me upside the head. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, just a little bit of sting. Right. Yeah. So. But, but kudos to you and a huge testament to, to what kind of an employee you are, just how valuable you are to your customers. So, um, well, share. So tell me then, um, what has been the biggest lesson so far in your career? For me, it's been building relationships Mm. because the majority of people that get to work with me and my team are referred to me. Mm -hmm. Um, so having, having tenure with some of your clients, you know, I hate to call it tenure, but when you're there three, four, five, six years, um, you, you develop that kind of tenure. And when they, when they tell other people, the things that you're willing to do for them and the battles that you've gone into together. Um, you know, those relationships are really important to me. And I, I don't think some of the larger consultancies get the time or the opportunity to develop relationships as deep as I do. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been at my clients' life celebrations, whether it's weddings, children graduating, and yeah. engagement parties. I've been with them at, you know, life's defeats, you know, getting fired, a death in the family, you know, yeah. really awful things. I was the only woman on an all-male team, and the manager asked me to help him pick out an engagement ring because I was the only woman almost on the entire floor wow. of the client. He's yeah. like, I need a woman's perspective. I'm like, sweet, happy to help out, you know? <laughs> and she was really happy with it. So I was <laughs> to contribute, but, um, you know, it just, it seems like every client that I've had a really long-term relationship with, I leave there with a really great new close friend. You know, I didn't have a traditional collegiate experience because I was working. I've been working since I was 15. I started college when I was 17 and college was always challenging because when I started college at 17, I had an apartment and a car payment too. So I was working multiple jobs trying to go to school. So I didn't, I didn't develop that core group of, you know, people that you tend to develop in college. I find those at my clients, you get really close with another woman, or maybe you get really close with the manager and it's beyond, you know, happy hours and chit chat at work. It, it becomes these really strong relationships that you, you miss when you don't get to see those people every day, but that you work to keep in play. So um, one of the mentors that I had at the last corporation that I worked at I reached out to him a couple years ago just to stay high. And by golly, he has almost picked up mentoring me yet again, almost 30 years later. Wow. So, and to have that kind of a relationship with somebody and to have that kind of experience from so long ago, yeah, to have them feel that you, you still bring value and you're still worth investing in, that's huge. So yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, one of one of my former clients is uh, my estate planner. Um, if anything happens to me, he's because he's such a savvy business person. Yeah, responsible for you know if anything happens to me or my husband, he's responsible for taking care of all of our family and all of the charities that we want taken care of. Another client, she's my dog godmother. If anything happens to us we want our dogs to go to her because we know that she will take care of them. They're both senior dogs and, you know, she's yeah. not going to pawn them off on somebody else. She will give them the oh. rest of their, you know, yeah. best days. So, I mean, these are the kind of impacts that people at my clients um, have had on me as well. Wow. So yeah. I mean, yet again, you know, when you, 
projects are war sometimes, whether they're war against the customer, war against the product, or war against management. When you go into battle with people yeah. and you're really truly invested in them and their happiness and their well being, and you're treating each other well, you know, when the manager's like, hey, you know, I know you were on call all, all last week on accident, like it wasn't your scheduled week. I'll yeah. take your week this week because you, you did it, you know, and for you as the consultant to say the same thing to them, hey, you know what, I will come in over the weekend and I will get that implementation done. Don't worry about it. Go enjoy time with your family. No. To have that yeah. kind of reciproc reciprocative relationship yeah. between client and consultant, um, it it I think that's my biggest lesson is those relationships have been so rewarding and and they matter. So I'm I'm a silly, I'm a silly LinkedIn user because I like to connect with people that have jobs and people that are looking for jobs. Mm -hmm. Because people that have jobs, mm -hmm. they will have jobs. Maybe this job isn't the one for me or for anyone in my network. Happy to pass along whatever they have. But maybe the next time around. Yeah. And the same, it, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. The same for the person who's looking for work. Sure. Just because they don't have a job now doesn't mean they won't have a job down the road. Doesn't mean there's not an opportunity to lift somebody up. Heaven forbid, if I actually know them and can, you know, put in my two cents. And if that helps, helps them in any way, shape or form, you know, to entertain another opportunity. So, you know, we can be mm -hmm. kind no matter what. <laughs> yeah, I so agree. You know, uh, uh, growing up, you know, thinking that business had to be so, you know, uh, unpersonal, so not personal at all. It was just, it's just business, right? You will hear that saying all yeah, the time, but it's 24 seven. Yeah. It, it, yeah. You, there's, there's not always a delineation between personal and professional right. and business and client yeah. and consultant, mm -hmm. And it, it's not like that. Yeah. And people matter. People it's, matter and yeah. relationships matter. And yeah. you never know, you know, don't burn the bridge because 30 years later, you know, uh -huh. it might pop back up. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So sure. Tell me, so what, you know, having worked with data and, and, and consulting on, on data projects, what is your definition of data? Gosh. It's a, it's a really great question. And I have to say that until I support, until I pursued uh, getting my CDMP, I had a very narrow vision of what data was, sure. but uh, also being active um, in marketing for my company and for other, other companies, data and information can just be found in so many things. It's not mm -hmm. just text and numbers anymore. It can be pictures, it can be graphics, it's it's content, it's documents. I mean, we're, we're inundated with data. It's coming at us from our phones, from Roombas, from Alexa. It just right. yeah. it is everywhere. Um, you know, we're not all using it the same. Uh, you know, obviously I'm not maybe utilizing my Roomba data like Roomba is, but it's, there, there's so much information out there. Uh, I think, you know, the definition of data is, you know, what, what's its use and its value to you because, because we are inundated with so much data, some data might be important to me and some data might not. So you know, my car telling me that one of my tires is going to go flat. That's probably really important data to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, yeah. And I don't even have Alexa in my house. I like, because I've been in tech for over 35 years, I like to unplug from a lot of things mm, at the end sure. of the day. Um, so I know there might be some things that, you know, I'm still writing down a grocery list in a planner or on a piece of paper, if I can get it into my phone so I can text it to my husband, if he's going to the store, you know, that might have some level of importance, but my sister, you know, she just says, Alexa, add this to the grocery list and it's done, you know, but she's a single mom. So she needs all the help she can get. So data is, it's all around us. And I think um, my eyes have been opened over the past several years yeah. to that. And because we're trying to harness all of that information around us um, for 
do you gain some type of value out of it, whatever that may be, whether that's personal or professional? Uh, I love it. So, and, and do you then see the importance of data management and the number of jobs uh, working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and, and why? So I definitely see the importance of data management increasing over the next several to 10 years, especially as we're implementing next generation technologies. Uh, with the state of the current job market and continued layoffs that we've been experiencing for years in tech, which has taken a lot of our project managers with us, which has taken a lot of our HR talent with us. It's it's hard it's hard to make that call whether that's going to increase or decrease. I think companies are trying to right their ships from COVID. Uh, there maybe was some over hiring during that time. I want to snatch you up because I don't want my competition to have you. The world is uncertain. We've recovered from that. The world is a little more certain. It is an election year and weird things happen with the job market in election years, um, you know, pre and post. So we'll have to see what that impact is. But people are still going to be working with data and companies are still going to be trying to acquire more data, consume more data, use more data, generate more data. So... You know, and there's there's definitely an increase on how many people are going to college for data skills education. And, you know, some time ago, if I was applying for a job in Denver, I really just had to worry about competing against other people that lived in Denver. Well, now, you know, work is remote and it's a global market. And I have to compete not only for people that may or may not live in Denver, but I have to compete with people globally. And so many more people are going to school to work in data, whether that's to be an analyst or an engineer or a programmer developer or a data scientist. So the competition is, is stiff. And if the jobs tend to stay the same, but we see this increase in people getting this education, then in a weird way, it almost looks like the jobs are decreasing. At least the education isn't in line with the demand. Interesting. So then what advice would you give to people looking to get into a career in data management? You and I have both talked about it. It's it's being curious. Um, I was asked the other day, you know, what would you tell your 12 year old self? And I said, well, okay, I didn't have STEM when I was 12. There wasn't bring your daughter to work day when I was 12. Um, you know, now we have we have all these opportunities to, to network, to find our tribes, to um, learn from each other. But with our kids, they're inundated with data. We give them cell phones and iPads and um, tablets and we we do that in some cases as a as a babysitter you know I remember my little brother had a little Nintendo Game Boy and that was his babysitter in a lot of respects that was you know how he got into tech um, so our kids are inundated with technology do they just become kind of numb to it and they lose that level of curiosity or they're interfacing with it all the time that they don't know how to turn it off and so they're not super curious about it anymore. It's like, oh, it's data. I'm inundated with data all the time. You know, sure. for yeah. us, you know, having a home computer was almost like a differentiation in class almost, you know. Oh, you have a home computer. You guys must be middle class or something, you know, and having access to tech. And there, we just, we don't have that challenge everywhere. You now I right. know, you know, there are there are environments and locations that are still I live in a rural area. My tech goes down all the time up here. I can't always keep a good internet <laughs> connection. So, you know, whether it's certain locations, rural areas, certain cities, you know, it's not fair to say that access to tech is 100% greater, but it definitely is more widely available for all of us and and for our children. And I just, I don't know if our children are going to stay curious about, well, how can I get involved with this? And 
you know, we don't have, we don't have the Jetsons made in our house, Rosie, you know, cleaning for us yet, but right. it, you know, it could come, you know, we, we had the robotic dogs a few years back and things like that. And, you know, they're still working with those in some, some of the AI capacities too. So um, just trying to maintain that curiosity and trying to find your space. And there's a lot of tools out there for people to do that, whether that's networking or, uh, educational systems like Dataversity, you know, there's lots of opportunities there. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention, um, you know, join a local DAMA chapter. You know, I'm the VP mm -hmm. of marketing for uh, the DAMA Rocky Mountain chapter. And it's, yeah, that group is very different than other mm -hmm. networking chapters that I've belonged to or been on the board for. And it is very data specific and having, you know, all that support around the CDMP and the DIMBOK and then having all that support around EDW and DGIQ events. And, you know, it it really opens your eyes to all the opportunities that are out there around data. And so, you know, sure. and that, that, has, that goes back to, again, finding your tribe. You know, yeah. so I found my tribe it was definitely with DEMA. And yeah. I found my tribe when I went to DGIQ. I had so much fun and I wish I would have been able to attend more sessions and everyone was really cool. Um, I, I almost had, I think I had standing room only in my session that I spoke oh, at. So, awesome. yeah. And it was yeah. so great to meet all of you guys. And, you know, we, we instantly bond over, we're in the data community and these are our people and and, yeah. uh, you know, and, and it's so funny, I go to conferences and speak at conferences, and I run into people there that are in my local Denver community that I never see, but I will travel <laughs> all the way to the ocean <laughs> to hang out, you know, hey, and, you know, we all glom onto each other, this yeah. is my, tribe, this is my Denver people, <laughs> you know, you know yeah. finding your tribe and, and joining groups and, and staying curious. I think those are really great ways to find your path in data and it's even those conferences. I love the camaraderie of the speakers. I like to attend yeah. other speaker sessions. I take pictures of other speakers when they're speaking because we don't always get that opportunity. And if we're the ones speaking, you know, if you don't ask somebody, you're not, you're not capturing that memory. You don't have, you know, what you need for your social media and for your marketing and, you know, to be your own cheerleader. But I love hearing the stories from some of the other speakers. I was a teacher. I was this, I was doing this other thing. And now I'm in data and, yeah. and to see, you know, how their journey wasn't maybe very complicated. They didn't have a lot of hurdles to jump over. Coming from teaching, moving into data was almost so seamless. It's crazy. So hearing some of those stories from some other speakers on, you know, how they've gotten involved in data. Um, those are just some of my favorite opportunities at conferences to learn more um, about the people. And again, goes back to those relationships matter. Yeah. <laughs> It's so true. It is so, so true. And it's part one of my favorite parts of the data community. Everybody is so helpful and so kind and so uplifting and just following a passion of and just willing to help competitors even and just, you know, just up, do whatever they can to uplift each other. It's just it's just great. Yeah, it's that it's so weird that you say that because I at DGIQ, I met these two sisters mm -hmm. and they said, we've never had a competitor be so nice to us. And I said, you guys are Kansas City. I'm in Denver. You have your world. I have mine. I mean, we're all yeah. global, but like, yeah. like <laughs> I might, somebody might contact me from Kansas City. We might need to partner. What does it yeah. hurt? We're not competing yeah. today. You right. know, we're not both filling out an RFP. Why can't we be more friendly about it? You're my people. Exactly. <laughs> <I'm your> people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Sherry, it has been such a pleasure to chat with you today. Um, I, and I want to make sure uh, how, if somebody wants to solicit your services, how would they find you? I'm probably easiest to find on LinkedIn. My name is pretty short. Uh, I absorbed my Twitter handle uh, into my name. So a lot of people know me as the Data Nista. Um, it's how I do a lot of marketing. It's uh, how I present out in public. There's a fun story behind that, but we'll we'll let it go for today. <laughs> um, people can ask me that one in person. I'm happy to share. 
So, but yeah, definitely on LinkedIn. And then uh, my company, Fox Consulting, does have a website that's pretty readily available on any Google search. So oh, I love it. And we will be sure to publish those links with the podcast so people can find them easily. Well, Cher, again, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you so much for having me. And I love being a Dataversity member. I love DGIQ conferences. And uh, it's my pleasure to contribute to your podcast series. Oh, it's been so nice. Oh, and thanks so much. And for all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest in podcasts and in the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time, stay curious, everyone. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe.